Welcome back to a new episode of Coach's Corner, this time Boys Water Polo Edition. I'm Jake Lancer here with Danny Lynch for HWTV, and today we're joined by varsity head coach Jack Grover. The Wolverines are currently 9-3 and three and have been absolutely dominating teams left and right so far this season. Before we get into any details about your players, can you give us a little background information about yourself, where you've coached, how many years you've coached, and so on? Yeah, totally. Um, so I started coaching actually at the Rose Bowl Aquatic Center when I was still in high school, just about your guys' age. Uh, I think I was 18, so that puts me at 10 years of coaching. I'm 28 now. Um, I played at UCLA, and then after I graduated, I coached there for one year, went and played a year professional, and then did another two seasons there. So three years total there. Um, and I've also coached at the club level uh, at the Bruin Premier Club, which is now part of LA Water Polo Club, um, which is actually pretty cool because I coach some of the kids that I coach now when they were 10 years old. Um, so I've had a long-standing relationship with Harvard Westlake. My dad actually went here um, when it was Harvard School for Boys. Um, so really excited to be here. Um, that's it. How's your first season been going so far? Uh, there's been ups and downs for sure. Um, you know, some of these guys have had Brian as a coach for the majority of their life, and learning a new style isn't easy. Um, but I think we're making all the right steps to come together as a cohesive unit. Um, the two losses by one are obviously tough for sure. Um, but I think what we've been able to take away from those losses is more valuable than the wins that we've had by, I don't know, 15 for our first four games. Or, um, I think we had a couple five goal wins as well. Um, so do you ideally want an undefeated season? For sure. Uh, but I think the lessons that we're learning are, are again, much more valuable. Definitely. So. For you to come down from, you know, Division One Athletics, Power 5 school like UCLA, there had to be something pretty enticing about coming down to Harvard-Westlake, whether it was the players on the team or the program or whatever. But what really was the main motive for you to come down to Studio City? Uh, there wasn't one main motive. Uh, first, I wanted to see how I would fair as uh, a head coach. Um, but what was really enticing was everything about Harvard-Westlake is collegiate except for the age of the kids. And that's one of the first things I heard in my interview and talking to Matt LaCour on the phone before. Um, and everything about that has, has held true. Um, and I say just the age of the kids because the way that they operate, uh, the way that they train, it's been very collegiate and the way that they think actually. One of the things that I thought was going to be a challenge was bringing college ideas to high school players, and it's actually been one of the easier parts um, for sure. But just being part of an athletic department like this where you have similar resources to a top four water polo school, uh, that was super enticing. And, you know, the history of this place, um, some of the best water polo players of the U.S.'s history have come through here. Um, and how would you not want to be a part of that? You know, yeah, it seems like you have a very similar background to actually a lot of the players on this team. I mean, you went to Loyola, which is very close by. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're going to you play uh, Division one sports, as many of these players will do. And you played on Team USA, which we do have many players who are on that team. How yeah. do you think these similarities have helped you as a coach? Um, one thing is, I think it's easier for to gain the player's trust, right? I have to gain their trust just as they have to gain mine. And having someone who's been through what they've been through or what they're going through and what they will go through, uh, I think it's definitely easier for them to relate to, um, especially when we talk about confidence, right? Because it's so easy to lose and gain confidence. And um, when they're going through something, it's very easy for me to find a time in my career where I was going through something similar and, uh, you know, help bring how I got through those moments. Um, so I think, I think that's been, been really helpful. And also in the recruiting process, um, I want these kids to be the best version of themselves they can be and get to the best place they can be. And just using what I've gone through to help them uh, navigate that, I, I, th I think it's been pretty helpful to this point. Mm -hmm. I'm going to track back to how you have several Team USA players. How do you think they affect the culture of this team? 
I think just the ability of being able to bring different styles of water polo that they've been exposed to is, is really, really important. Actually, we're trying to plan a trip to go to Europe uh, over spring break so that everybody on our team can get this experience. But being able to see how fast the game moves in other countries, uh, being able to see how important water polo is in other countries. You know, when you walk down the street in Budapest, it's not American football on the screens and in the bars. People are enjoying water polo <laughs> like, a, like it's, it's Monday night football uh, here, here in America. Um, and getting exposed to that as an early age could be the reason why some of these kids want to go on and play for the rest of their lives. I didn't get exposed to playing in Europe until later on. Um, but it's part of what drove me into becoming a coach. Um, so I want to give them those experiences. I think it's awesome that the kids who are already with the Team USA, that, that they're getting those now. Um, and it's also they play a completely more physical game and bringing that to our guys. So when they play against bigger, stronger players, they're not backing down because they get it every single day in the training. Again, you have such a deep team, and, I mean, you have so many great players that also yeah. probably play similar positions. How do you utilize every single player and use all their strengths during uh, game situations? Totally. That's one of the toughest parts, for sure. I mean, we played in a tournament this weekend where the first two games we legitimately played 27 players. And that's not normal at all. And we played 27 players against a legitimate varsity team and that Corona Del Mar team. And every single player was able to hold their own. Um, and there's going to be times for sure where players are going to be underutilized. And that's just the reality of having a team this deep, right? But making sure when it's time to develop players, we're focusing on that. And when it's time to win games, fewer play players will play. But they'll all have their chance. And I think what's really special about a group like this is when one player goes out, the next person is up. And in playing 27 players early on in a tournament, everyone's going to be ready for whatever their moment is, whenever it comes. Um, so it, it's that, but it's also in the training every day, making sure that players get different looks with different groups. For example, yesterday we put the seniors all on one team, and then mostly the underclassmen on the other one. So do they get beat up a little bit by the seniors? Totally. But the underclassmen are going to be better off because of it. Um, so just being really crafty and, and thoughtful in the way that we plan out trainings and make sure that guys are getting to go with certain groups and against certain groups, um, that's, that's the way that I've tried to utilize it the most. And then also with the way that we sub, we're going six in, six out almost every single time until the game gets a little bit later and we need to rely on that experience from the older players. Yeah, just going off Danny's point, you know, obviously the team's absolutely loaded in every position and that's honestly one of the better problems that you could have as a coach, <laughs> totally. right? How does that allow you to do certain things that maybe other teams like competition can't do? I think w one thing is we can definitely disguise what type of plays we're running at the end of games, right? I can use Chris or Jack Burkhart as a center in the same way I can use Jeff, who's a center on the perimeter, if, if, if I really want to. Um, and that's not going manifest, to manifest itself right now um, because I don't want every, every school seeing that. Um, but we can definitely hide what we're doing better than other schools can. Um, and also, you know, with me being a new coach, I do have the element of surprise where no one fully knows what I'm going to do. Um, actually, not even my players yet, <laughs> <laughs> which might be a little nerve-wracking for them. But I think we're really developing the trust right now. Um, so, yeah, just, just that, that I can use a player in a way that other teams can't because I have so many that I can rely on. That's great to hear. And, you know, you mentioned Chris Arkelian or, you know, Jeff Coretz. You've got a lot of seniors there, but you also have some underclassmen with Aiden Romain and Otto Stoddard, and they've yeah. really been making a lot of noise. How does that sort of factor into your decision-making process where obviously you have these veteran seniors who can hang with anyone, but you also have these rising younger players that honestly are like, you know, they're competing for time, right? Yeah. 
I mean, early on, it's all about giving the younger players uh, experience and allow them to build their confidence. And whether or not they play down the line, getting that early confidence where they know I can play against legitimate D1 bound seniors as a freshman, I, I just think it's super valuable. And for me and for our team, it's not so much about how much you're going in. It's about embracing whatever your role is. Um, and I think the younger guys have done a really good job of that. And I think the older guys are doing a good job of when it's not so much their time to be playing, not being selfish about it. Um, and that's really, really not easy to do. So kudos to them. Um, but I'll give you an example. Uh, I talk to these guys about the Spanish national team a lot, how there's players who aren't so well known. Maybe their job is to go in and every time the ball goes into center, take an ejection, which if you're looking at stats, is it the best thing to be taking ejections? Uh, objectively, probably no. But if that's what your team needs you to do, that's what you have to do. And you have to push your ego aside. And I'll use Luca as an example. Sophomore. Uh, I think he was one day away from being a 14 and under this year, playing 16s, played a little bit of 18s. Um, and in the Newport game, we had him start. And I told him if the ball goes in and you have to go take an ejection in center, that's okay because now they have to play through our five-man. And I think we have one of the best goalies in the country. Um, I think our five-man could be the best in the country if we continue to work on it the right way. And if he prevents a goal by taking an ejection, and they have to play through our five man and we get a stop, that should be a stat, but it's not a stat, you know? So I think to go back to what your question is, our underclassmen and our upperclassmen, they're both embracing whatever their role is, so they make it easier for me. Um, and that's that's the short answer to yeah, that question. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> no, I mean, it's obvious that there's a lot of talented guys on the team, and with you being so knowledgeable about the game, there's a lot of different things that you guys can do. You know, we've talked a lot about the success that the team has had so far this season, but what's one sort of, I don't want to say problem, but what's one thing that's been difficult, whether it's in the pool with a sort of scheme or in the locker room even, but what's one difficulty that you've had since joining the team? I think the number one most difficult thing, and this isn't unique just to Harvard Westlake. Um, it's, it's the consistency piece, um, not playing down to another team's level. Um, we're trying to create a standard where we just operate how we operate and no external factor, uh, can influence that. And it's much easier said than done. Right. But once you establish this mentality, no one can rock you. A fan in, in the crowd yelling at you, saying you suck or something like that. It just doesn't break us because it's not something that can dictate how we operate. And building this mentality takes time, totally. But I think you see in this modern day game, we go down by four. And was anyone really freaking out? We just chipped our way back. Um, so although that loss, that's a challenge, right? Losing to a team like modern day, who's a good team, don't get me wrong. Um, but not freaking out and staying the course instead of letting your head go in any number of places that it could go down for in, in one quarter, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, one challenge for the team this season, or I guess even in past years, has been playing against Newport Harbor, obviously one of the best teams in CIF and arguably in the country, right? Yeah. It's definitely been a challenge, I guess, getting over that hump, you could say, for the team in the past couple of years. And although you guys did already play them this season, there's a decent chance that you guys will probably meet again in the postseason. What do you think the team needs to do to sort of get over that hump the next time that you guys face off? You know, going back over the film from that game, in the second half, we tried to emphasize doing the new things that we're working on instead of reverting to old habits. And I don't know if you guys watched the game, but at the beginning of the third, we went on a four-goal run yeah. where we score four and they score zero. And then after that, we start reverting back to old habits um, where if we can commit to what we know works and what we've seen in the video works, I think we can beat anybody in the country. Yeah. Um, and it's not so much about who we play. It's about how we choose to operate and what we choose to do. 
um, which not every team has that luxury, right? But again, it's, all, it's also easier said than done, uh, you know, creating this consistent mentality. So. You have upcoming games against Oaks Christian and Palos Verdes. How are you going to be able to use those games to prepare for such a big one against the really tough <laughs> J. Sarah team? Totally, yeah. Um, look, we're not looking past J. Sarah or PV at all, right? I think we have shown when we don't give a team the full attention they deserve, we don't play the way that we should, the way that we're trying to operate. So we're taking those games one by one. Um, and I'm trickling in a little bit about JSR every day in practice that maybe they don't know so much, right? Because their job is to focus on right here, right now, where my coaching staff and I, it's our job to be thinking about what we're going to do in the future. Um, so I think the real focus right now is on Oaks and PV and locking in our routines and how we operate. Because if we operate the right way against the J. Sarah, we should be right there in that game. I don't care who they have. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, I am still going to jump ahead to that J. Sarah. <laughs> no, go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to jump ahead to the J. Sarah game. I mean, we all know it's no secret that they're a great team and yep. this will be a battle. And this game is also on homecoming. Yep. And yep. that's really tough, I feel like, on some players since they might, like, it's going to be a huge crowd. There's going to be people there who want to watch. How do you think that might affect the players? Do you think it could help, and or do you think it could be a detriment? Ideally, it shouldn't affect us either way, right? Yeah. If we're just focusing on, on ourselves and how we how we do things, um, I'd imagine the support from Harvard Westlake is going to be big, and that's obviously going to help, right? Um, but putting so much pressure on a game like this or a championship game, for example, a lot of the time you find that the best uh, water polo isn't played in a final because there's nerves and there's going to be nerves in this game. And just letting them know, which we've already talked about this, we've been in so many big games just since the summer, right? A J.O. final, um, you know, the crossover game to get to the semifinals for our 18s uh, where, we, where we didn't succeed the way that we wanted to. Also, the finals of um, the Elite Eight tournament down south in modern day, where we have the experience, but we need to make sure that we're relying on that experience and going to it and knowing that if we go down a couple goals right away, it doesn't matter because it's a long game. Just as we did against the modern day team. Look, I mean, there was was so much more that we could have done better in that game, but relying on those experiences to take us through a game like that where there's going to be pressure, there's going to be people yelling, it's going to be a crazy scene. And letting them know that just because all of that's there, we're not going to let it change the way that we operate. Thank you so much for joining us today. No no problem. Hopefully I (laughs) answered your questions well. You did. It's my first first interview. So. Um, Good luck to you guys. I'm Danny Lynch with Jake Lancer. We'll see you next time on Coach's Corner. Enjoy the game.